Okay, let's begin. I think people will continue to join us, but welcome to everybody who is here. I'm Rabbi Jessica Graff, joined by Rabbi George Altschuler here at Congregation Sherith Israel, and you'll meet our distinguished guests in just one minute. Welcome to our fourth in the series In Focus, Israel Gaza. This has been a wonderful opportunity for us to welcome speakers from all different parts of the world. <laughs> we add the world today as Avital joins us um, from Israel and um, to talk about issues relating to Israel and Gaza, to ask many questions and to hear lots of ideas. As we've said, each time that we've introduced a presenter, the point of this series is to welcome dialogue and discussion, to bring ideas that we don't necessarily agree with or that we haven't heard before, in some cases, an opportunity to ask questions of people and to really get discussions going. So we welcome all different ideas here and want to hear experiences of many people around this topic, which is so important to all of us. I'd like to introduce Oleg Ivanov, who's the San Francisco director of the American Jewish Committee that is co-hosting our program today and invite you to say a few words, Oleg. Good morning. Thank you, Rabbi Graf and Rabbi Altshuler for hosting this important conversation at Sherith Israel with Avital Leibovich, our director at the Jerusalem Office of the American Jewish Committee. I'm Oleg Ivanov. I'm the assistant director at AJC San Francisco. The American Jewish Committee is the global Jewish advocacy organization. AJC San Francisco connects our community with AJC's global advocacy work to enhance the well-being of the Jewish people and Israel. Our access to diplomats, elected officials, and interfaith leaders at the local level advances AJC's broader global priorities, combating anti-Semitism, promoting Israel's place in the world, and countering the spread of radicalism and extremism. Our impact extends well beyond the San Francisco community, helping AJC achieve tangible results in the form of government policies, formidable alliances, and hard-hitting legislation that make our world safer and more secure. AJC San Francisco regularly engages in high-level diplomacy with the more than 35 countries that have diplomatic representatives here in the city. Through pioneering interfaith and intergroup outreach, we build bridges of understanding with San Francisco's Latino and Muslim communities. Our Young Professionals Network, Access San Francisco, also brings together emerging Jewish leaders. This week, AJC San Francisco hosted Pirhi Levy and Michael Levy. Michael's brother, Orr, is a hostage in Gaza. Orr's wife, Enav, was killed on October 7th at the Supernova Music Festival. Their two-year-old son was thankfully with his grandmother. Michael presented Orr's story in a series of meetings and programs with elected officials, members of the diplomatic corps, corporate leaders, and community members. This included meetings with former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, several mayors, including Palo Alto, Sunnyvale, and San Jose, Frontrunner candidate for Congress, Sam Licardo, leaders from the Hindu and Sikh communities, and Stanford administrators, faculty, and Hillel students. Michael was also featured in an interview on NBC Bay Area the same day as the SFO airport was shut down by anti-Israel protesters. Highlights from this advocacy trip will receive additional coverage in the coming issue of J Weekly. This is just one example of how AJC San Francisco works with our national and international colleagues to fight anti-Semitism and support Israel here in Northern California. Again, we are grateful to Rabbis Graf and Altshuler and Sheriff Israel for hosting us today. Thank you. Thank you, Oleg. It's a privilege to be able to co-host this program with you and to partner with you on so many things. I wanna let people know that the prior three conversations in this series were recorded and are available on our website. So if you're interested in hearing those as well, you're welcome to do that. Today's program will be recorded, is being recorded as well. And I wanted to remind you that at the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen allows you to ask questions, which are seen only by those of us hosting. And we will um, be able to fold those in with Avital as much as possible throughout the conversation. The format today is a little bit different from the others that we've had in that we've asked Avital to begin with a briefing. She's going to talk to us about what's happening on the ground in Israel, and then we'll continue with a dialogue. So 
formal introduction, I will tell you, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Avital Leibovich is the director of AJC in the Jerusalem office, as you've heard. Her distinguished career spans over 30 years in a wide range of senior media and public relations positions within the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, where she served as the face of the IDF to the international community during critical events, including Operation Cast Lead and Pillar of Defense and Gilad Shalit's return. Before coming to AJC, Lieutenant Colonel Leibovich, Colonel Leibovich served as head of the interactive media branch of the IDF Spokespersons Unit, a branch which she established as a response to the rapidly growing influence of social networks and internet platforms in the media world, making the IDF the first military in the world to operate social media accounts. Previously, Lieutenant Colonel Leibovich also held the position of head of the foreign press branch, where she maintained strong connections between the IDF and the international media, working with audiences worldwide and giving thousands of media interviews. Since her retirement from active duty in the IDF, Lieutenant Colonel Leibovich has been doing reserve duty in the IDF Northern Command, where she continues to use her knowledge and experience to benefit Israel. On October 7th, she was called to reserves and served for over 50 days, contributing to Israel's security on the Northern Front. In addition to her position at AJC, she taught a course about public diplomacy in the 21st century at Reichman University for Law and Government students, training and inspiring the future generations of diplomats and advocates. For her work in strengthening relations between Israel and Albania, Lieutenant Colonel Leibovich received the Knighthood of Skanderbeg Award in June 2021. She is the first Israeli national upon which this honor has been bestowed. Lieutenant Colonel Leibovich holds a BA in English Literature and Political Science from Bar Ilan University and an MA in International Relations from the University of Haifa, as well as a diploma in Spokesmanship, Communications, and Public Relations from the Department of Foreign Affairs at Bar Ilan University. What an incredible bio. <laughs> Um, how extraordinary to have you in person with us, not just your bio and all of your accomplishments, but your vision and your insights and your report really from the um, from on the ground just outside of Jerusalem and Israel. We're so grateful to you, not only for taking the time to be with us this morning, this evening, where you are, but for your work in helping to protect Israel and to be a spokesperson for understanding what's happening with the entire world. So thank you for being with us this morning. We're gonna move to a speaker view so everyone can see you well and look forward to hearing your opening remarks and your account from within Israel of these last very painful five months. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for hosting me and your very respectable congregation in San Francisco. It's an honor to speak with you today. Um, I'll try to uh, give you an, uh, an overview of the current situation here on the ground in Israel. Um, and Israel is, has been fighting five fronts, six October 7th. And I want to go in depth a little bit to these fronts and the implications and um, uh, the outcome and, and the day after, different kind of phrases we are, we've been hearing and reading about. So I want to begin with the main front uh, right now. And everything I will say, of course, is attributed to this point of time because we are in an ever-changing kind of uh, situation and things could rapidly change even tomorrow morning. The first front and the main front is the uh, front in Gaza, the war in Gaza. Well, we have made a few mistakes in Israel uh, on October 7th or mistakes that led into what happened in October 7th. Uh, the first one I would say is that we fell in love with quiet. We thought in Israel that if we would uh, create some sort of a stable economy or stable economic situation in Gaza by allowing 18,000 Palestinians from Gaza to enter Israel and work, then that calm would have an impact on the uh, motivation to uh, commit terror acts. And we were wrong um, in this concept. The second uh, concept where we failed was the technology. We put a lot of trust on technological means 
which were part of shaping the operational concept on that border. And October 7th, those means collapsed one by one and left us uh, embarrassed and, and not prepared to, uh, to answer and fight those 3,000 uh, Hamas and, and other Palestinians who infiltrated and breached the borders from 22 different places, by the way. And uh, these two, uh, two mistakes brought us to a situation of war in Gaza. The IDF spent a major part of the, of the war starting from October 27. They were only October 27 began boots on the ground, Israeli boots on the ground in Gaza. Until then, it was only um, aerial attacks on Hamas targets. And uh, right now, we have uh, succeeded clearing more or less uh, the uh, northern part of Gaza. And that's the major effort which the war began at. And then we moved to the center part of Gaza. Uh, the, the forces are right now operating in an area called Khan Yunis, which is close to the center part of Gaza. There are still two areas in central Gaza which Israel needs to focus on in terms of fighting against Hamas. And only then it will move to Rafah. Now, the two main goals of the war and I want to say them very clearly because there are a million versions, and I think we need to clean also the, the politicians who obviously are speaking to their um, political base when, when they're describing the situation. There are two main goals to this war. Number one is to release and bring home the hostages, dead or alive. We have right now 134 hostages held in Gaza, four of them. Uh, are held there since 2014 uh, from a previous operation. Two of them are soldiers who were killed in a previous operation in 2014. Two others are um, a Muslim Israeli and another Israeli in Ethiopian origin who crossed the border into Gaza in 2014 due to some psychological issues. They're still held there and they're counted as part of the 134. Out of this 134, we know that there are uh, 34 people who have died, 34 hostages which are dead. So from our perspective, when we say return the hostages, it doesn't mean if they're dead or alive, we want the return of all the hostages. The second goal of the war is to collapse Hamas governance. Not ideology, because ideology has a tendency to float around and stay, could be for a very long time, but to collapse the governments, the governance of Hamas, which means that they will not be able to run Gaza from a civilian perspective and from a military perspective. Right now, we are seeing the fruits of some of the military successes. For instance, uh, some of the chain of the commands of Hamas have been broken. So a platoon commander has no battalion commander to call and ask for orders. Um, until now, Israel eliminated something like 65% of the Hamas uh, militants, but uh, the road is still long. And the expectation is that a few more months will take before the entire uh, Hamas uh, um, military and capabilities will be destroyed. Now, Hamas has invested 17 years in building itself. Many of the tunnels are very advanced in capabilities. For example, if you want to place your intelligence uh, command center underground, of course, you need the relevant infrastructure. This is not something you build over a year or two years or a few months. You need funding, you need the infrastructure, and you need the know-how. And we have found servers underground uh, that actually were there at least 10 years. Uh, the, ex the estimation is that uh, many millions of dollars have been invested in the Hamas capabilities to build itself and to prepare for a day like October 7th. I can say that... Um, from uh, 
a clear military perspective, and this is something which may amaze you, the number of soldiers, boots on the ground in Gaza today are half than the number of soldiers we have in the West Bank. In Gaza, half than the soldiers we have in the West Bank. Um, the reason is that uh, the current part of the war is very, very accurate, very pinpointed. Many, many houses are booby trapped with, with uh, explosives. So the forces are moving very carefully from one house to another, from one school to another, from one clinic to another, trying to expose the ammunition, the storages, the rocket storages, and also the tunnels. We originally estimated in Israel that the tunnels, the, the length of the tunnels is something like 400 kilometers all over Gaza. And now we understand that uh, it's closer to 700 kilometers than 400 kilometers. And again, many, many years of investment allowed Hamas to, to reach such a situation, to reach such a goal. And so the forces are really unveiling, uncovering tunnels really on a daily basis, uh, which is really unbelievable, the sites that, that they're seeing. I'm estimating that it will take a few more months until the war in Gaza will be completed and uh, and the goals uh, will be, I hope, completely fulfilled, but I, I'm not, uh, I, I cannot really vouch for, for that will happen 100%. Um, we are seeing, for example, with the hostages, a very, very tough negotiations with uh, Hamas's leader, Sinwar, which is hiding in a tunnel, as you know, uh, probably in the Khan Yunus or Rafah area. And, uh, and the reason is that um, they don't have really a lot of motivation to, uh, to go into a deal with Israel. Um, the humanitarian issue, for example, this was a leverage that Israel could have used at the beginning of the war. But since the second week of the war, where Israel doubled the aid going in and then tripled the aid going in, uh, there is no really pressure on Hamas because they have food, they have water, they have electricity, they have medicine. There is no shortage from their perspective. They can sit in tunnels for years and hide and, and receive whatever they need. Um, before the war in Gaza, every day, there were something like 70 trucks that entered Gaza with different kinds of goods. When I say goods, it could be hygiene products, it could be um, electric appliances, it could be school products, it could be food, it could be anything really the Gazan people uh, needed and bought. Of course, they went through some sort of an inspection process and then went in. Today, the average per day of trucks going in is approximately 220 trucks uh, with approximately 3,000 3, tons of food uh, in, with all of these uh, uh, trucks going in. The vast majority is food. The second place, there is sheltering products, tents and things like that. And then there is medicine and water, which is going on. And of course, cooking gas as well. Tankers go in with cooking gas um, as well. So we we lost we Israel lost the leverage of humanitarian aid. There is no pressure on Hamas on that, and um, and the only pressure that it has left in order to move forward towards a deal divides into two. Number one is the military strength that uh, Israel uh, has on the ground, and number two is Egypt and Qatar, uh, which are pressuring. Hamas with different kinds of uh, measures, for example, threatening to de deport all Hamas uh, uh, leaders from Qatar could be uh, some kind of a measure of pressure. So um, in addition to the humanitarian trucks going in, Israel is facilitating two additional routes for uh, humanitarian aid. The first one is parachuting from the air. I'm sure you've seen those pictures. Uh, I want to explain that every time there is a parachuting from the air, Israel needs to halt all its aerial operation in that area. 
because obviously you can't put uh, aircrafts in the air um, targeting Hamas targets when there are parachutes with goods there. So there is full coordination. And the second issue is the temporary pier that is currently being uh, built in the northern part of Gaza. Why north? Because that's an area where Israel has relatively control uh, from a security perspective. So that's where we are in Gaza. Uh, I want to move on to the second front. As I mentioned, we have five. The second front is the West Bank. Now, two weeks before Ramadan, which we have, I think, um, celebrating the seventh or eighth day of Ramadan, um, two weeks before Ramadan began, we saw uh, a campaign, a very active campaign on social media by uh, different uh, groups, terror groups, Hamas and others, not only Hamas, calling and urging all uh, Palestinians to uh, attack Israelis, basically Jews, wherever they are, primarily in Jerusalem, but not only. And given the fact that 34% uh, uh, of the Palestinians use TikTok, a lot of, of that campaign was also on TikTok. Unfortunately, some of this incitement sunk in. And in the last uh, week, we have seen at least three different incidents in which 14-year-olds and 16-year-olds decided to stab a Jew. Now, in these kind of situations, this is very difficult to foresee and to predict, and also based on intelligence, because this is a 14-year-old or 16-year-old kid who woke up in the morning after he saw something at night on TikTok, went to his mother's kitchen, took a knife, and then first thing the, the, the day after, the morning after, decided to, uh, to stab um, an Israeli person. So it's really difficult to uh, to see and, uh, and and monitor something like that. Sometimes we are more successful, other times we are not. Unfortunately, we've seen these times last week. I can tell you that on Temple Mount, uh, the prayers are going really undisturbed. Uh, I think at the height, we, we saw something 35,000 um, Palestinians who prayed. Uh, relatively quiet, no um, uh, no special uh, events took place, and and um, including Friday, uh, last Friday, which was the first Friday of Ramadan, also uh, was quiet, and and thank God there wasn't any um, clashes or anything of that sort. So uh, we are hoping that Ramadan will continue and and be quiet. I'm not sure that will be the case, but we're we're hoping. Um, but the reason that there are so many forces on the ground in the West Bank is not because of Ramadan. It's really because the Palestinian Authority lost its governance approximately a year ago on something like five different cities in the West Bank. Now, when I say lost its governance, I mean by that, that the security apparatus does not step foot in those places. Um, the uh, arrangement Israel had with the Palestinian Authority for many, many years was that Israel supplies the intelligence information, and then the Palestinian forces, which are around 40,000, they spread in the different villages and different cities. According to the intelligence information that Israel passes to them, they go and arrest that or detain that relevant suspect. And in this way, we can prevent suicide bombers in Israel, we can prevent uh, different terror attacks inside Israel and so on. Unfortunately, as I said, the support of the Palestinian street to Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas, in the last couple of years really went down. Today, the average is around 13 to 17% of the people support uh, Abu Mazen's government. Uh, basically, the main claim is that this is a corrupt government, and the second main claim is that the government does not represent them. So many of the cities that I mentioned develop their own mechanism, which is an alternative mechanism to the government, to the to the governance of uh, of the Fatah party, the Abu Mazen's party, and therefore the security apparatus does not enter. And if they don't enter, this means that nobody's stopping the terrorists before they 
reach Israel. And that's the reason why we have so many uh, uh, soldiers who are operating almost every night in specific areas. They have arrested more than 1,300 Hamas terrorists inside the West Bank since the war began. Um, and uh, of course, those who are detained were not terrorists. Of course, they are being released, but the level of threats is still very high. At every given point, there are something like 200 plus threats of immediate terror acts uh, planned in the West Bank and meant to be executed in Israel. And that's the reason why this is a front, and that's the reason why there are so many IDF forces on the ground. The third front, and this is actually the front which is uh, worrying me, I would say, the most, that is the front in the north. Uh, and here, I don't differentiate between Syria and Lebanon. I would like to look at this area as one unified front. Syria is a failed state, uh, suffered seven long years of a civilian war between 2011 and 2018 in which on an average week, 250 Syrians were butchered. Israel had nothing to do with this war. It was an internal war, but it left Syria in a very, very bad shape internally, economically, and also as, as a place where dozens of terror groups are operating. Many of them you have never heard of. There are many, many pro-Iranian Iraqi militias which are crossing the border from Iraq to Syria and operating there on the ground. Um, and uh, in Lebanon, the situation is really dire. Since the explosion in the Beirut port by, uh, by, Hama, by uh, Hezbollah on uh, the August of 2020, the economic situation in the country really went down the hill. And just to give you an idea, $1 uh, equals something like 20,000 lira, uh, Lebanese liras, just to give you the understanding of the proportions. Uh, Hezbollah um, is uh, an enemy on a totally different scale than Hamas. First, they hold around an estimation of 150,000 rockets. Think of how many militaries or countries in the world that even share this amount of, of weapons. And Hezbollah is not a country. It's a terror group, as you know. Um, they have built themselves since the 80s, primarily in South Lebanon, which is a Shiite area with many Shiite villages, with underground infrastructure, with tunnels, with bunkers, with warehouses of storages. They're operating from the villages, but also Inside uh, Lebanon, one of the most famous neighborhoods that is a home to many uh, senior commanders of Hezbollah is called Dachia, and this is a neighborhood in Beirut. Um, Israel never has or never had anything against the Lebanese people, no territorial demands, nothing against the people themselves. Uh, the problem is that Hezbollah was built on, on one main goal, and that is to eradicate Israel. And that's the reason that Iran is investing billions uh, in Hezbollah. One of the uh, forces that Hezbollah built in the last decade is a special commando force called Radwan. The goal of Radwan, which is a commando unit, is to situate themselves on the border with Israel and be prepared with the, with the right command to infiltrate the border into Israel, to enter villages on the Israeli side, kidnap, kill, murder, control, occupy the villages. And this is something, of course, that, uh, that Israelis are very much concerned of, especially after October 7. I didn't mention this, but 120,000 people have been evacuated from the south envelope of Gaza and other communities. And in the north, on the northern border, there is around 60,000 people that have been displaced since October 8. That was the first day in which Hezbollah decided to fire rockets towards Israel. So October 8, Hezbollah is trying to uh, present itself as the savior of Lebanon, of the resistance group, and they want to show their identification with Hamas. So since October 8, 
They have been firing constantly rockets, missiles, aerial drones and aerial vehicles towards Israel. For a matter of fact, for the last two months, there are more rockets targeting Israel from by Hezbollah than by Hamas. Now, we're looking at more than 3,000 rockets that have been fired by Hezbollah since October 8, and something like uh, close to 1,000 drones of different kinds. Drones, as you know, probably uh, can serve as surveillance, but they can also be a deadly tool, if especially if they carry explosives. And I have to say that when I served on reserve duty on October 7th, I got a phone call from my commander at 2 p.m. Uh, on Shabbat, and I packed my bag, and I drove up north to where I served 52 days. Uh, the base where I served was a constant target for Hezbollah. But the base uh, that I served is also in the middle of a city. And uh, imagine a situation that some of the rockets would hit the base, but others would hit civilian areas around the base. For example, a kindergarten full of kids. Then we could be in a totally different situation today. And this is still a scenario that could happen in another hour or tomorrow morning. Israel right now is not going to a war in Lebanon. It chose the path of diplomacy there is an American envoy who flies back and forth to Beirut and to Jerusalem by the name of Amos Hochstein and is tried to, uh, tries to negotiate with the Lebanese, with Hezbollah, um, through mediators, through other parties. Uh, this has been going on for a few months now without any luck, without any results, but Israel is still giving it a chance. I can also say that uh, there are two... Uh, other parties which are involved in the negotiations. One is Germany and the second one is France. But if we find ourselves in a situation in which a rocket would hit by mistake a kindergarten, a school, a hospital, any civilian facility and will lead to the deaths of many people, I think it's fair to assume that uh, we will find ourselves in uh, in a different kind of uh, situation because Israel would not be able to pass quietly on such a reality. Now we have lost lives of more than 10 Israeli civilians um, that were killed by Hezbollah attacks. Uh, there is a huge economic burden. For example, 20% of the egg of the eggs uh, of Israel come from the north. And when the people have evacuated their homes, obviously they evacuated the farms and the chicken farms and, and nobody is there physically to take care of it. Uh, and of course, agriculture, crops, everything that is grown there uh, is not, uh, of course, being taken care of for the last five months. So there are, of course, economic uh, and economic uh, issues uh, to, to this uh, fighting in the north. Now, um, there are some days that we get a barrage of 30 rockets, 40 rockets, 50 rockets from Lebanon into Israel. If you go to Metula, for example, this is the most north uh, Israeli village. The assessment is that 80% of the houses in Metula have been targeted one way or another. Some, of course, are capable for, for living, others are in a better shape. But what I really want to say is that um, when the situation will stabilize, there is a whole process of renovating, rebuilding the communities in the north, plus gaining the trust of the people that have been evacuated to return to their homes. And that will be, I think, quite a lengthy uh, process is not going to happen tomorrow, tomorrow morning. We had a peak of rockets um, uh, earlier uh, this week, 100 rockets in a very heavy barrage uh, were fired. But until now, I can say that um, Israel has killed uh, close to 300 Hezbollah terrorists since uh, October 8. 
and also targeted uh, a few um, targets which are considered high quality. For example, a drone factory in Lebanon and others. But the main target it's important for me to mention are Hezbollah and Hamas Lebanon. There is also Hamas Lebanon. They cooperate, they, they work together side by side. The Lebanese people are not a target of, of Israel in any way and Israel doesn't have anything against the Lebanese people. Um, so that's the North. I'm very concerned with the fact that uh, an escalation uh, may take place in the north. And uh, this could happen, as I told you, with the scenario I mentioned, this could happen really any day. The fourth front is the Houthis. Now, I'll divide this front into two. The first part is the, attacked, the attacks towards Israel. Now, let's give you some details about the distance. Iran is 1,300 kilometers from Israel. Yemen is 1,800 kilometers away from Israel. So for the Houthis to attack Israel, you can understand without being any military professional that it takes quite an advanced system of rockets, of drones, to fly this distance of 1,800 kilometers. Now, these missiles, which they have been firing, are missiles that cost millions. Now, how could it be that Yemen, the poorest country in the region, has this capability? And the answer, of course, goes back to Iran, which again has armed the Houthis for many, many years, giving them the know-how, exercising them, the, giving them the uh, drones with explosives and the right kind of missiles that can uh, reach Israel. I'm, I'm happy to say that with a, except one or two cases with drones landed in open areas, uh, all the other uh, missiles and drones and infiltration attempts through the air were uh, actually thwarted. Um, and uh, this does not mean that the Houthis will not continue to try and attack Israel, but um, at least uh, the, 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 the level of the air defense was, was quite good. The second part to the Houthis has to do with the international community and not specifically with Israel. Now, when there are communication cables in the Red Sea, that five out of 12 of these communication cables, which are being operated by a communication company, well, these cables have been cut, then uh, the problem is not an Israeli problem. Now look, only 20% of Israel's commercial goods pass through the Red Sea. The rest goes through other channels. So it's not really an Israeli issue. The coalition led by the US has been working on the ground with different countries for the last six weeks, I believe. For me as an ex-military, I always like to check the results. And um, still I can see the Houthis attacking vessels almost every week, which means that the, the coalition working against the Houthis should consider maybe taking a more aggressive approach uh, because so far uh, the goal has not been reached to freeze the, the Houthis capabilities and to deter them from continuing and attacking uh, vessels in the Red Sea. The fifth front and also not uh, less important than the four others has nothing to do with weapons, uh, but this is the front of the legitimacy. Now, there have been more than 40 meetings at the UN Security Council since the beginning of the war. Many of the meetings resulted in drafts um, and uh, the countries that uh, uh, gave those drafts wanted to call an immediate ceasefire to Israel. Thank God that uh, in the US for standing uh, on Israel's side and vetoing uh, at times which was necessary to veto those drafts, because if Israel does not, it will not fulfill the, if Israel ceases fire tomorrow morning because of a UN resolution by the Security Council, then 
we have lost our capability to defend ourselves. And, um, and we are very happy that the U.S. is standing by our side. Of course, uh, watching with concern the different comments that are being shared back and forth by leaders from both countries, but still understanding that there is a very strong U.S. support for Israel at this point of time and appreciating that support. Um, however, in other countries, this is not always the same level of support. And without this legitimacy being maintained and strengthened, then we can find uh, the next couple of months uh, very challenging. I can share with you that the German chancellor just landed in Israel a short time ago, and uh, this is already a second visit of the chancellor. Germany has been also very active in its support um, for Israel. Obviously, when there are more and more pictures coming out of Gaza on a daily basis, then I understand how difficult it is to maintain the legitimacy because there is the same scenes that repeat day after day. And, uh, and you know, footage from wars are never, never an easy, an easy thing to see. So these are the five fronts that Israel uh, is um, coping with. Uh, very challenging, very difficult. And I think, uh, Rabbi Graf, that we can open it uh, to questions at this point of time. I'm sure there are many questions from, from the viewers. Thank you so much for this incredible sort of framework that you've given us to understand the real challenges of being in Israel now and of loving and supporting Israel and the safety, ensuring the safety of Israel. There are many questions from um, people who are watching. And also, I have a number of questions too. I want to just ask you one and then open to Rabbi Altschuler to bring in really a number of questions and to bring in the audience's questions as well. I wanted to just ask you about ceasefire. Um, it's a, something that you know we're hearing a lot about in the United States, and people are using this word a lot. And I'm wondering what what is the response of of people in Israel? How are you understanding what ceasefire may or may not mean? So uh, the understanding in Israel is that uh, without cease with ceasefire, we have lost what we achieved until now in the war. So the vast majority of the people are interested in continuing and reaching the goals of the war. Having said that, if you are putting on a scale ceasefire versus releasing the hostages, then there is a vast majority of Israelis who support releasing the hostages and then resuming the fighting. So it's not something which resembles a permanent ceasefire, but maybe a temporary ceasefire that is well accepted by, by the majority uh, of Israelis here. Great, thank you. And thank you so much for that five point framework. I think that's a really useful way of thinking about things. Uh, we've received a number of questions about the humanitarian situation in Gaza. I wanna read one and then I wanna share an excerpt from a from a statement by Georgios Petropoulos, who is the UN coordinator for aid to, to Gaza. So the question from the congregant is, the information you said it <clears throat> about humanitarian aid going into Gaza is completely different from what news media here are saying. We have consistently heard that few trucks are allowed to the checkpoint and that hundreds of trucks went through before the war. How do you account for this difference? And the statement from Georgios Petropoulos, who is this UN coordinator for um, for aid to Gaza, describes people starving in Gaza and adds that there are people dying of malnutrition in hospitals in northern Gaza. So I'm wondering how you account for that discrepancy between both what we're hearing in the news media here in the United States and what this UN coordinator for aid to Gaza is saying. Yeah, great question. My first and foremost recommendation would be not to use media as a general source of information and rely only on the information from the media. I'd like to suggest, because the, the numbers about the humanitarian aid that goes in every day are transparent. For those of you who are an ex, what used to be Twitter, 
I recommend going to the account of COGAT, C-O-G-A-T. That's the body in the Ministry of Defense in Israel that facilitates the aid into Gaza. And every day you can find there a summary of the number of trucks, how many tons was on each truck, and what kind of um, uh, goods went into Gaza on that specific day. Every day, the information is totally transparent. In addition to this, I wanna say that right now in Gaza today, there are 20 bakeries which are functional. 20 bakeries uh, baking something like 2 million pita breads a day. Now, if that would be a situation of a starvation, then you know you wouldn't see this amount of uh, uh, bakeries and, and 3,000 tons of food which enter every day to Gaza. That's not an issue of starvation. Malnutrition, yes. I think that uh, in some areas there is malnutrition um, for different reasons. Uh, we are trying in Israel to create different ways to enter aid into Gaza. The problem is not the quantities, but the problem is the distribution. Because until a couple of weeks ago, 60% of the aid, up to 60% of the aid that went into Gaza was taken by Hamas. And then it failed to reach to those areas where it was most needed. And in those areas, that's where we had, we saw some malnutrition. So what did we do in order to bypass Hamas? Because Israel is not everywhere in Gaza. As I mentioned, we are not everywhere. So um, what did we do? We tried, for example, to facilitate a convoy of trucks in the middle of the night, hoping that in the middle of the night, there won't be mobs of people around the trucks trying to grab everything, and the trucks will be able to uh, transfer the goods to the neighborhoods where it's needed the most. I have to say it did not work every time, uh, but this is also some of the things we are trying. Last week, Israel opened a new route for trucks crossing in Israel. And, uh, and this is another route that uh, we are hoping will help primarily Northern Gaza, but not only from receiving the goods. So my best recommendation summarizing this issue of humanitarian uh, aid is going to the official sources in order to uh, receive the information. Again, it's transparent. And just to, to give you an idea, every day, every evening, there is a meeting between the Ministry of Defense folks and the American uh, envoy to the humanitarian issue, uh, which is Ambassador Satterfield as well as the agencies which are donating um, the food and aid. By the way, the Emirates are the, the country that donates the most and the Saudis are the second place. And every, every evening there is a reassessment towards the following day. So again, the information is transparent, it's there. Uh, I think you will be amazed to see the real numbers. But none of this information comes to us. You know, it's so public. When, it's, it's public. You know, it's, totally public, public. But it's public, but it's not information that that Americans are receiving through news media or through, um, you know, what we hear about is very one sided, and no one is. Uh, there was a, an excellent question that was raised here. No one is asking why um, Hamas is not responsible for the starvation or the malnutrition if they're taking and siphoning off the goods that are going in. So this contributes enormously, I think, to Israel's. Um, you know, bad PR, um, it, yeah. it, especially in the United States and around the world, as Israel is blamed for this situation of, of starvation and malnutrition. So It's what... even more than that. It's even more than that, because when you say nobody asks questions, let me take you back a few months ago when um, the media reported, all of the Western media reported that Israel attacked a hospital in Gaza killing 500 people. So quoting Hamas numbers, which gave a number within 20 minutes, nobody asked how could they count 500 names in, in, in 20 minutes. 
or even how is it a round number? By the way, half an hour later, they increase it to 600. Nobody asked to see footage of those allegedly 500 people who were killed. And nobody asked, how could it be that a small hospital with 80 beds, suddenly there are 500 people killed? When Israel provided evidence a few hours later showing that uh, it has nothing to do with Israel, Israel never operated there, it wasn't an Israeli attack, it was a failed launch by Palestinian Islamic Jihad, which actually targeted a few cars in the parking lot of a hospital. Then the media began to publish, uh, uh, you know, explanations and things like that. But you're right, they're not asking questions. And I can tell you that two days ago, the international media, which Israel, as you can imagine, is a home to hundreds of representatives of international media platforms, Israel invited those uh, uh, those journalists to go and see with their own eyes the new pier and the passage of humanitarian aid trucks. And uh, the idea was that they would see and they would report and, and, and interview. And, and uh, I mean, I went to see it with my own eyes, I have to say. Two weeks ago, I took myself and my car and I drove two and a half hours to the border with Egypt and I sat with the commander, not the commander, the director of the crossing, Nitsana crossing. There are two crossings facilitating, Kerem Shalom and Nitsana. I went myself and, and I saw it with my own eyes. So obviously no, not everyone can do it, but um, but the media has should at least give the entire information, especially when it's transparent. But at the end of the day, I don't pay them salaries and the government of Israel doesn't pay the reporters' salaries, and uh, they base their uh, images mostly, their stories mostly on images from Gaza, and they put the focus on direct houses and and uh, and homeless people and give you a very narrow angle of the reality on the ground. This creates an enormous problem for Israel in in world right. opinion, right? The maybe the biggest of your five fronts. Um, causing... And also, and also, in terms in in the media in the media world, October seventh, it's like ancient history. For us here in Israel, we still live October seventh. Every Israeli you'll stop on the street and ask him where were you in October seventh will give you an exact outline where he was, his partner, the kids, the fa the extended family, every because we are still very much there. But from a media perspective, this is ancient history. They moved on and on. So even the, the need to keep on remembering these hostages which are still in Gaza and trying to bring the stories, it's a battle. It's a battlefront. Another area of questioning we're receiving is around uh, the bombing and the shelling of Gaza. And I'm curious how you respond to criticisms of the amount of bombs and shells that were, that have been um, launched and dropped on Gaza, especially given that uh, President Joe Biden described it as indiscriminate bombing. I'm curious how you react to that. Well, we work in the IDF with a legal advisor, with legal advisors. Every brigade, infantry brigade, brigade is the... Uh, uh, the um, mechanism uh, above uh, battalions. So every brigade has a legal advisor. This legal advisor needs to approve each and every target. And according to the international law, if there is a civilian facility or house or building that is being used as a terror entity, then you have the right to, uh, to target it. Now, again, we have nothing with the Palestinian people. We have an issue with Hamas, which breached the borders on October 7th, 3,000 people for 22 places. Now, since they have invested millions in building their arsenal for 17 years, then you can imagine that there is an above the ground Gaza and there is an underground Gaza city. And uh, in order to eradicate the tunnels in order to target all the launchers and all the amounts of explosives, we have no choice but to defend ourselves in targeting those targets. Now, according to the um, depth of the tunnel, this is the extent of ex explosive we're using. If it's deeper, 
40 meters, a huge tunnel that can you can drive cars inside. That's one type of ammunition. If it's a smaller, then you don't need. We don't we 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 don't enjoy using just ammunition. This is not the goal. The goal is to really create a new reality. And by the way, I'm surprised that nobody asked about the day after. Because look, this is again a term the media is using. Now there's really no a day after. We have to be here very realistic. We're looking up for years after. We're looking even towards a generation after. Because at the end of the day, Israel doesn't have any interest in governing Gaza. We have two choices to make between a one, one is a worse choice, one is a bad choice. The worst choice is Hamas, and the bad choice is the Palestinian Authority, because the Palestinian Authority today still allocates money of its annual budget to terrorists and their families. So imagine the Nukba, which is the commando of Hamas, the Nukba terrorist families are getting paid compensations from the Palestinian Authority, and which that, that doesn't make any sense, but this is what we, we're dealing with. And Abu Mazen, as I told you, is not really popular, but we understand that in order to replace Hamas, we have no choice but to have a Palestinian Authority. Now we can call it revised, revitalized, reformed. We are not there yet. It's not reformed, it's not revitalized, but again, from the two solutions, this is less worse than Hamas. Now, when they will come in, we are hoping in Israel that many moderate Arab countries from the region will embrace them and will help them to govern. Uh, for example, Egypt or the Emiratis or the Saudis or all of them together, maybe even Jordan. And only after a period of governance, which could be quite a long time, I'm talking about years, then there can be reforms in other areas. Now, take the children, for example. The brainwashing of the children, the level of incitement is unbearable. I mean, there are camps which Hamas is organizing for children, summer camps. It's not summer camps in the Poconos. It's summer camps where the kids are training how to kidnap a soldier. Now, for creating a new generation of people who don't want to make sure that Israel disappears from the face of the earth, it will take at least a generation. It could be done. I don't think that it cannot be done, but it will take a very long time. Therefore, when we're referring to the day after, then please see it as a very, very lengthy process. A question was asked, um, what level of communication exists so that Israel is aware of how many hostages have died? And I, um, I don't know what you can tell us or reveal, but how much um, knowledge is there about the location of the hostages or the well-being of the hostages? How is that communicated back to Israel? So there are a few ways of um, uh, a few sources for uh, intelligence. Uh, uh, gathering about the hostages. Uh, the what, what we know in Israel is that there are currently 134 hostages. Four of them are in Gaza since 2014. Two of them are dead, two soldiers, and two, two people, two Israelis. Uh, one of them is Muslim, the other one is Jewish, who crossed the border into Gaza due to some mental issues in 2014. So 134 altogether. From this number, I can uh, verify, and this is what the Israeli authorities know, that 34 are not alive of these of this number. Now, intelligence is is not a hundred percent always, and not always do we have the full information. Um, sometimes we do, and we can uh, release hostages, like a very heroic operation that took place a few weeks ago, in which two uh, older men were released in the middle of the night in a very successful operation. But of course, everything has risks and has to be calculated very carefully. Um, and um, and that, that's what I can tell you. Uh, we do have intelligence. We do have different means to gather information. Do we know everything? No, unfortunately, we don't know everything. 
the subject of hostages, I appreciate how when you laid out the goals of the war, you were very clear that there was first the goal of releasing and bringing home the hostages that are alive, and then secondly, um, the collapse of government of Hamas's ability to govern in Gaza. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious how you respond to the challenge that the war, if 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 the number one goal is to bring home the hostages, the war as it is now is not actually achieving that end. Because like my understanding is that very few hostages have actually been saved by the IDF and the vast majority of hostages who have come home have come home through the initial ceasefire. So I'm, I'm curious how you respond to that, um, that counter argument. Look, I think more than 100 hostages were released after 50 days. 50 days is not a short time to, to be in uh, captivity. And so, so there were achievements, some achievements uh, that you cannot ignore. But um, I'll tell you, I think that um, Hamas doesn't really have an interest to go to a deal. Think from Sinwar's perspective. Why should he go to a deal and release prisoners? He does, what does he care about Palestinian prisoners in Israeli prisons? What's his goal? His goal was achieved on October 7. So why should he make an extra move and release more hostages? He has all the aid he could get. He doesn't care about his own people because he's risking them, because he's operating, he's sending his people to operate from within densely populated areas, even today in Rafah. So from Sinwar's perspective, there is no motivation. But the motivation could come from either Qatar, like I explained before, in Egypt. This could have some uh, leverage on Hamas. Now, look, the current deal on the table uh, that we saw in the last 24 hours, talks about uh, release of 40 hostages, which are women, children, elderly and ill, um, and uh, quite a significant number of prisoners for all of this group. Uh, and I think negotiations on the number, that could work. That's not the, the hurdle. The main hurdle on this current deal has to do with the fact that uh, Hamas wants uh, either seizing fire or returning all the people to the northern part of Gaza. By this, again, we will be eliminating all the achievements of the last five months. So Israel could not agree to that, but there is some room for negotiation. For example, if we return part of the people and not all of the people, for example, women would be able to return. Kids until the age of 10, I don't know, I'm just making up. So there is some basis for negotiations uh, and Israel could, could go to that direction. But the question again is, is Hamas willing to go the extra mile? And I'm not sure the answer is positive, unfortunately. Now look, we have parents of hostages that have two kids which are hostage. We have more than one uh, families, more than one family who has two kids uh, uh, held hostage, which is unbelievable. I mean, the, the, their lives is hell. And uh, we in AJC, by the way, facilitated uh, a lot of meetings for them when they came to the US, to Germany, to Italy, to France. Um, and we also uh, try to support them in different ways. But um, but again, when you think about the deal, think of it not from a Westerner perspective, but from Hamas perspective. So Adam Chase, who's a leader of AJC here, um, asks a very important question, and I'll read you his exact words. Clearly, Israel is losing the media war. Is there a realization of this in Israel, and what are they doing to change it? relating to what we were talking about before and how can we get you know, more of the reality of the story from Israel out? So yes, it's, it's very well understood here. Um, and uh, in order to do it, in order to, to I don't wanna say return fight, but in order to try and impact, I, I don't think balancing would, would be relevant here, but in order to impact the current situation, and you can see Netanyahu, for example, who is going and giving interviews uh, in American media, 
and answering different questions which maybe are not clear where Israel stands on, on different issues. Um, you can see that uh, there, at least I, I see the talking points that um, the government prepares every day. And there is a lot more emphasis on the humanitarian issues. Uh, so the spokespeople are um, ordered to speak and give the numbers of the humanitarian aid and, and highlight this as, as part of their focus. And also there is no week that goes by without hostages families that appear in media somewhere in the world because they travel and they do a lot of local media whether they're in Germany, whether they're in Europe elsewhere and in the US. Um, and uh, and that's what we can do. Also on social media, there are a lot of initiatives which take place. Is it optimal? No, far from it. Uh, we are also very small in number compared to the anti-Israeli sentiment, which is huge. It's a uh, hundred times more than, than our capacity. And that's why everybody who is a part of this call could be uh, recruited to the advocacy efforts because all you need is the right information and the numbers. And when you get that, you can also write, tweet, write an op-ed, get an interview and so on and so forth. So I do believe that the more people will be active then um, the better situation will be on the media. But more important than the media is Israel's survival. And we cannot cease fire at this point of time uh, because we will then lose our capability to defend ourselves. And don't forget that all the terror organizations in the area are watching closely. Watching closely, how is Israel reacting? Uh, when Asrala, the head of Hezbollah in Lebanon, is seeing Rex in Gaza, I'm sure that he's thinking, should he take the risk and have the same wrecks in Lebanon. Because today I can tell you that some of the villages in South Lebanon, if I will show you the footage, you will not identify whether it's Lebanon or, or Gaza. So there are also other circles which um, are watching carefully. And, and remember the neighborhood that we live in. Three out of Israel's borders, three out of four borders have Iranian presence in them. This is not Switzerland or Liechtenstein, or anyone, anything else. So the most important goal at the end of the day is to be able to defend this country. Great. Um, we've, I've asked a few of our participants this as a last question before. I'm curious to ask you also, what gives you hope in this moment? You can't live in Israel and not be an optimist. <laughs> There's... There is no choice. And um, uh, right now I'm speaking to you from Tel Aviv. And if you'll go down the street here, you'll see that people are in restaurants and people are jogging outside and people are going to work and living their lives. Of course, they're doing it with this cloud over their head, this burden on their shoulders. Because at the end of the day, when 350,000 reservists showed up on the week of October 7th, these are our families. My husband went to the Air Force for reserve duty. My daughter went to the Southern part of Israel for 60 days of reserve duty. I have a son who is in mandatory service. He's in a special unit. So just like my family, there are many others. So we are a part of, we are actually an active part of this defense and, and we do believe in our strength. And also, the resilience of the Israeli people is something which is not like anywhere else in the world. And the fact that uh, people believe in the capability of the army to win, and, and even not even the army, there was a huge amount of volunteering all over the country during the first three months of the war, from cooking to soldiers, to, I don't know, buying blankets uh, for people who were displaced or whatever. I mean, all, all every, every city in Israel had a center for people who, do, who were donating and, and giving from their time and efforts. And I think it speaks volumes for who we are as a people. Um, and of course, obviously, 
I think the support of the Jewish diaspora in the U.S. and uh, beyond is also critical and also important for Israelis and solidarity missions that come here. I think are very important. Um, also, the people themselves see the situation on the ground, but I think it strengthens the relations between us that sometimes can suffer uh, because of the distance between uh, the countries. What a beautiful answer to close with. I want to thank you so much, Lieutenant Colonel Avital Leibovich, for being with us this, this morning, this evening, depending on where you're located. Um, and uh, to say to you, as I said to you last week, you know, it's very different being in the United States and being in Israel, of course, in this moment and in these last five months in particular. But um, we stand with you and send blessings for prayers, our prayers from here, Congregation Share at Israel and San Francisco and um, the, the community of the United States for, for safety and for peace for your family and for all of the families of the region. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I will say amen to that. And Am Yisrael Chai, as always. Am Yisrael Chai. Thank you all so much for joining us.